go. The crew is already here. Everybody has signed on early. Let's uh, let's just get it going. Why? Might as well. We got a ton to talk about. It's Pike and Steinberg with you. Flames Nation Live is underway on a Friday. Uh, Zach first in. We got Zach and Jeff and JF and Josh, uh, Dylan and Ron all through on this Friday night. There's Noah. Noah's like the ninth in. He's usually number one. We got lots of people with us, live with us on Flames Nation Live. Happy Friday. Hopefully you're doing well. Uh, hello, Pike. You had just, uh, we were just talking a little bit before we went live on the stream. Uh, it has been a week per Ryan Pike. Hey, it's been a, uh, it's been a busy stretch for you, hey? Well, I remember, well, I remember what, was it, uh, like a, a week ago? I think a week last night that, uh, I went out for snacks after the Thursday game, <laughs> and when I came back, they had a different head coach, and I had a lot of work to do. And it's been like that basically uh, for the last week. We had two games of Ryan Huska as coach, and then a few days of practice, and then uh, the the re the redebut of uh, of the Jolly Rancher behind the Flames bench, and uh, you know they 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 got two points. They probably it was a, it was a schedule win in the sense that. Montreal played a game the night before in a different time zone at 9 p.m. Mountain, got off the ice at 10.30 Mountain, or 11.30 Mountain, probably didn't get into the air until close to midnight, and then they had to come in. You know, so the, the, the fates were not on Montreal's side, but the Flames did a fantastic job making life tough on them, and that's, that's what they have to do from now on. They have to play the hand they're dealt every single game, and they had good cards last night and played them well and won. And, you know, Daryl was very, you know, Daryl-ish about it. Uh, you know, they played a good game. He said they were you know, pretty good. You know, he, he didn't hate them. He spent most of his time doodling. And then I uh, said they're, they're going to face a much better team on Saturday because Montreal will be, you know, fully gassed up and at 100% and probably a little bit pissed off at how they played against Calgary on Thursday. So good start. We'll see what happens. Good start. I mean, you're right. It's only one game. I see Josh saying that right now. It's only one game. It's very true. But for one night anyway, you could uh, have a good shot or two of our friends at Deuce Vodka, the celebratory vodka. And uh, they are our sponsors here on Flames Nation Live. Happy to have Deuce Vodka on board with us. And uh, hopefully you were happy enough to uh, be celebrating following a 2-1 win over Montreal on Thursday. It is just one game, but at the very least, there are some positives. If you can't find Deuce Vodka in your local liquor store right now, uh, start on them. Make sure you demand it. Get Deuce Vodka in your local liquor store. It is available all across Alberta right now. Let's uh, let's let's read some of the comments early on. So Dylan says some of the best 60 minutes all season. Just need more goals, but that will come first game. Uh, this from Zach. Are we concerned that? Monahan, Gaudreau, Dubé, Kachuk didn't do much offensively last game, or is the Sutter deployment sheltering them? I personally thought it was a great effort from top to bottom, but the bottom six won that game. No doubt about it that the the best contributions came from Josh Levo, came from Derek Ryan, came from Sam Bennett. Uh, that was the, the, the driving force on Thursday night, Pike. What was interesting, though, was how many shifts at even strength Matthew Kachuk had in the final eight and a half minutes. The number was zero. There were no even strength shifts for Kachuk, particularly late in that hockey game. And, and eight and a half minutes in the third period, you'd expect he got one power play shift, but none at even strength, which, which certainly jumped up off the page to me and not I wasn't the only one in fact Daryl Sutter even made reference to a line that maybe he couldn't play late in the game on Thursday oh, I, I think Daryl is suddenly getting used to the fact that he's in a Canadian market again because you know he, he mentioned last night uh, you know in sort of in mentioning that there was you know the the really good performance by that Derek Ryan line so much so that Derek Ryan's line got put out with the with the empty net probably partially to see if they can get Josh Leva a third goal but also because 
they were playing good enough hockey that you probably could trust them in that situation. And, you know, he made the comment that, you know, I think it was, you know, could be that there was a line I, we couldn't trust in that situation. And, you know, uh, you know, our, our colleague Eric Francis asked about that both yesterday and today. And Daryl, not so much walked back to his comments, but he's sort of crouching his praise for his players. You know, he sort of, you know, he mentioned that there's a way that all their players need to play. Today, he mentioned specifically, you know, there's some of his wingers that he wanted to see more out of, which... Could be a Gaudreau reference, could be a Kachuk reference. I didn't think either Gaudreau or Kachuk were amazing. I didn't think Dubé was fantastic. Uh, I thought, you know, the, the backland line was good. Uh, I thought the Ryan line was good. But, you know, it's it's the first day with the new with the new boss, and they gotta, they're all going to be learning with the W. But, uh, yeah, they're, you know, it's it was good, not great. And I think, you know, I think the challenge is, and probably what we're seeing on Twitter and in the comments, you know, are Flames fans ready to get hurt again? And the answer right now is not really, because I think they've seen all season the good game, bad game alternation. So I think they need to see three, and especially with this week coming up. I mean, you know, you've, you've looked ahead at the schedule. Montreal tomorrow, who are no shrinking violets, then Edmonton twice, then uh, Toronto twice. So it's every other game, every other day this week, what, Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, against teams that are going to be good. So the Flames, you know, they start off with a, a team that's sort of, you know, right, the, the closest team they can reel in in Montreal, and they can try to reel them in a bit more tomorrow. But then they're going to face progressively tougher matchups. So if if the if you were going to build a schedule for the Flames to learn how to play defensive hockey all over again, this might be the the progression of opponents you need to to master it. Because if you don't master it, uh, you know Edmonton just put up seven on Ottawa, and they would probably love to do that again to the Flames. The interesting thing when when talking about Saturday's game, the one coming up tomorrow against Montreal, is is kind of the conversation about you know do you do you judge Thursday on a graded scale because of the situation Montreal was in now I I I bristle sometimes at this because every team this year is playing lots of three and four every team this year is playing tough back-to-backs but Montreal that was a bit of a that was a bit of a raw deal fourth game or sorry third game in four nights rather and they played start times 22 hours apart with a little travel and losing an hour mixed in there. It was not ideal circumstances. I give them credit. Like they played hard and they definitely had some execution issues, but they played hard, but I do expect them to be a better group tomorrow night. And it just puts the onus on Calgary to be as detail oriented and tight defensively and execute the same way they did Thursday, because I saw a lot of things that would be kind of uh, hallmarks of a, of a Daryl Sutter coach team. They controlled possession. They were up over 62% at five on five possession. They limited Montreal to just seven high danger chances per natural stat trick, six of them at five on five. They allowed a season low 18 shots. It was a one goal game. All of those things are kind of almost uh, prototypical Daryl Sutter hockey. So that's great, but, you got to expect the opponent to be a little bit different on Saturday. And as you said, it's been one step forward, one step back all season long. Now it's on the flames to do this for more than just one game, do it for a few games in a row and see where that brings you. Yeah. And you know, I think uh, like, like Daryl said the other night, like I, I think the challenge is, you know, can the flames, I think I think the challenge with the Flames is this, where I think, you know, we, we've heard it from a lot of the players over the course of the season, typically after losses, where they feel like they get too high after wins and too down after losses. Like when they score goals, they seem like they are they can beat anybody. And when they give up a goal or two, often by a fluky ways, they seem like, you know, somebody killed their dog. And I think one of the nice things last night was, you know, they gave it like use of Matthew trying to get around, blows a tire, turns over the puck. Shea Weber's shot gets tipped and all of a sudden it's a one goal game again. And, you know, that that's the type of thing that would cause the Flames 
a week ago, 10 days ago, to spiral a bit. And they didn't. So that's a good sign. But, you know, can can they... I don't think they really exerted their will over Montreal the way they wanted to. I think, you know, they, they control possession, but did they really get a stranglehold in the game? Like, they, they held serve, but did they just, you know... Right. That. Do they? That, I think, and I think that's the next step. I think that's what D- Daryl wants to see them do. And you know, for for those of you who who love hearing about analytics, uh, go to the Flames website, or uh, I believe uh, our friends at Sportsnet uh, slash nine sixty have it too. Daryl talked during his availability today about you know shot percentages or, and about just the idea of they need to have a certain number, a certain percentage of shots going toward the net all the time to be successful. And Did you notice who uh who is the guy asking him those questions? I, but the but it's it's for for you know Daryl has this sort of reputation as being sort of this very old school, you know uh, kind of kind of guy. Pretty much is. I think the, the his the, his methodologies are very old school, but he's you know especially in LA, you know, hearing from some folks who were in the Kings organization with him. He he took the analytics stuff like a, a, a fish to water, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see how he utilizes those here because you know with under Chris Snow the Flames have invested a lot in that they have sort of built out a lot of stuff that sort of touches a lot of different parts of their organization from pro scouting to amateur scouting to how they manage the team on a daily basis. So it was kind of cool to hear him responding to uh, a certain Sports at 960 anchors. Uh, uh, questions about that because I did not expect him to go into the, as much detail as he did. He's always been a guy like going back to his time in San Jose. That's always been, he's talked about offensive zone starts. He's talked about shot volumes and shot attempts before Corsi was a thing that we talked about. Um, he was talking about it. So, and then definitely in Los Angeles, I mean, that team, that team controlled possession every night. They were the best team in the NHL basically his entire time there. And last night we saw them control possession and shot attempts and shot volume for the final 40 minutes. That's one game. Let's see if that's something that becomes more of a regular thing when it comes to this team. JF makes a good point about Saturday's game. It'll be Carey Price and Net Price has been on quite the heater of late, although Jake Allen was fine uh, last night. Neither of the goals that he allowed, you can really put on him. I thought Allen was just fine and has been just fine in his meetings with the Flames this year. Okay. Let me uh, switch it up on you uh, and and give you a juicy topic to go into the weekend on as you're uh, with us on Flames Nation Live for Deuce Vodka, the celebratory vodka uh, in liquor stores across Alberta. If it's not in your local liquor store, make sure you get on them to bring it in. We are exactly one month from the NHL trade deadline. April 12th, 2021 is this year's late deadline. We talked about it on the big show on Sportsnet 960 today. We all kind of gave our number one right wing target for the Flames via trade because I think that many of us agree that that seems to be the biggest glaring need for this team uh, when it comes to their structure and how, how their roster fits. My number one target, Victor Arvidsson of the Nashville Predators. I know he's having a bit of a down year, so maybe that'll lower the price a little bit. There's a two-time 30-goal score, essentially a three-time 30-goal score. We're talking about a guy who's got a few years left at $4.25 million. Nashville is open for business. I think Arvidsson, as an analytics darling, would fit perfectly on a Daryl Sutter-coached team. So I go Victor Arvidsson. If you've got one, throw them in on the chat right now. But, Pike, uh, your reaction to Victor Arvidsson as a potential trade target for the Flames? I love the player. I like the contract because I think he's reasonably compensated for what he is. My question is, on a team that as of right now, according to my big, beautiful spreadsheet, has about $330,000 of cap space to work with, I, I don't know how they make that work. Like if if they can make it work, that'd be a a, a, a home run because he's he's versatile. Uh, so here's here's how you make it work. So it's you'd have to do some creative stuff, no doubt about it. But the way you make it work for me is let's let's throw Sam Bennett in as one of the pieces going the other way. Um, that does not cancel out the salary entirely, but say it's uh, Bennett and Shillington. 
two guys that we believe have what well, we know Bennett has. I think there's a belief out there that maybe Shillington has as well. I, I think Shillington trade. was reported last year that he had. Okay, so there's two guys that in the last year there have been reports out there that Shillington and Bennett have asked for trade. So let's just throw them in. Say that Nashville's cool with taking those guys and they want a first-round pick. Say it's something like that. I, I don't even know, but let's just throw that out there. So because Nashville seems like they are very open to going in a rebuilding direction, I think they'd be okay with eating part of the salary too especially this season to make sure the deal gets done because say they're getting an asset they really like a first round pick or a prospect or something I believe say it's just Bennett Bennett and a first and that gets you Arvidsson and they also eat the salary necessary so you can bring it in that to me especially for a team like Nashville or Anaheim or Buffalo or somebody like that who is clearly not going to be making the playoffs this year I think those teams would be willing to eat salary to make it work for their trade partner yeah and I think well, I'm just doing the math in my head to see how this would work yeah so there's there's 27 days left in the regular season cap wise after the trade deadline. So, uh, Arvids, if uh, straight up math, uh, Arvidsson's 4.25 minus 2.55 for uh, is 1.7 million difference. And if you prorate that difference over the remainder of the season, they would need 300 of cap space to make it work. So they could white knuckle it and make it work without having to beg them to, to take back salary or they could take back a bit of salary. And the, the challenge here would be you'd be asking them to take back salary for the room. Like you, you, for, for those of you who are not, you know, cap, uh, cap aficionados with a copy of the, the 2013 CBA by your bedside to fall asleep to. And it's a fantastic bedtime read. So be out like a light, uh, if they, you can, you're basically capturing a percentage of salary or the cap hit for the remainder of the lifespan of the deal. So Arvidsson would be, they'd have to hold on a percentage of Arvidsson's money until 2024. So you probably would need to do Bennett and a first rounder and maybe a prospect of some kind to sweeten that. I think it's doable. I think the Flames have enough prospect depth. You know, we, we've, you know, we, you, you've been talking to Mike Gould. I believe our friend Mike Gould was on uh, on the pregame show with you guys a couple days ago. Yeah, he did a horrible job. Just a true. But, you know, he's, he's, he's been, you know, covering uh, covering the, the, the AHL club very ably for us. Uh, so if you're, if you're the Flames, maybe you have to throw in a B-level prospect like a, a Phillips or a Zichka or a Pospisil. I'm sorry, Mike. I didn't mean to throw in Phillips, but... That's who I'd ask for, because uh, if you're the Flames, if like let's 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 just play this out. If I'm if I'm David Poyle, former Atlanta Flames assistant GM David Poyle, uh, I'd say, oh, okay, you want us to do you a favor? I want Bennett, I want a first, and I want one of your great prospects, Wolf Zary Pelche. I'm Pe if I'm uh, for a living, I go nah, and they go, well, I still I still want to get this contract out because it frees up some money for me. I'll tell you what, tell you what, tell you what. How about, okay, give us, give us uh, Emilio Peterson and we'll have a deal. Something like that. I think that's, that is probably how it might play out. Maybe they ask for Johannes Shinval or Mackey or Pullman or something like that. You, you, you're going to say a hard no to, maybe you throw in Mackey into the hard no's because that was, I think internally they see him as one of those guys that's probably in that mix with the A-level prospects. But Aside from like Mackey, Wolf, Pelche, and Zeri, I'm probably open to considering anything. Yeah, I mean, uh, a couple of people are throwing the name Ricard Raquel out there in the chat, and and Frank Saravelli reported uh, earlier this week the Flames have already, you know, pretty seriously inquired on Raquel. So, and and the price was too high the first time. Maybe it changes at the deadline. Maybe Calgary's desire to pay a certain price changes or maybe Anaheim's asking price comes down. So Raquel's an interesting one to me. Uh, Kevin LeBanc is fascinating. Sam Reinhardt you is mean, fascinating. Uh, those are all right shot forwards. Barry Colts, that I think would be boy, Kevin LeBanc. Yeah, re reunite him with, with Manjapani. And, and yeah, Anderson, like, you know, right? sure, he has to quarantine for two weeks. So, you know, you, you lose two weeks. So, you know, you 
any of these guys I've mentioned would have to quarantine for two weeks, which might put the uh, might put the accelerator on. Making but if, if you're worried, happen. like, you know, I, one of the th- reasons, you know, I think a lot of us in me- in hockey media were kind of skeptical about Montreal to throw it a name is that Montreal had so many damn new people and how are they going to coalesce with each other? And it turns out fairly well outside of the fact that the coach got fired. But for the most part, I think, you know, Montreal had uh, didn't have the chemistry issues we thought they'd have. And if you're making a trade in season and you're going to have to throw someone in potentially after two weeks sitting on the couch – you know, well, you know, you'll get them a recumbent bike or something so they don't get completely chubby. But, you know, they're not going to be able to really integrate with the team very quickly. You probably want somebody that some of your guys know. And LeBanc is – he's just good. He's, you know, I think he'd be good. Uh, Arvidsson, I think uh, – correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to remember his country of origin. And I th- Arvidsson? Arvidsson is uh, from Skelleftia, Skelleftia, Sweden. Sweden. Why, the Flames happen to have – the country of Sweden employed on their entire roster right now. They're- I and, and I think, like, honestly, I think Arvidsson, the reason why I like him so much and, and Raquel uh, to, a, to a similar extent, because both two-way threats, both very good defensively, both very, very used to playing top players on the other side. Both have got offense. But I think you could put an Arvidsson or a Raquel, both right shot guys, you could put them and they would fit like a glove on a line with Kachuk and Lindholm. And that would allow you to move Dubé with Monaghan and Gaudreau. Or I think, like, let's just take Arvidsson. I think Arvidsson would be a great fit on a line with Monaghan and Gaudreau and do a lot of the things that, that Lindholm did so well when he was with them. So I just think, I think both those guys with their contracts and with their ability to play it two ways with their ages, I I think that there's, there's plenty to like there in terms of contracts. The most expensive of the guys we've mentioned is Reinhardt, $5.2 million pending RFA with arbitration rights, followed by LeBanc at 4.75 for a number more years, followed by Arvidsson at 4.25 for three more years, finally followed by Ricard Raquel with one year left at just over $3.8 million. He'd be a pending UFA. At oh, the and, end and of you know uh, who you know, Victor Arvidsson won a gold medal at the 2018 World Championships with? Michael Backlund. Who? Michael Backlund, the captain of Team Sweden that year. Go. He got to meet the royal family. He got to meet the royal family. There you go. So, some uh, interesting options as we are now a month out from the 2021 NHL trade deadlines. It's uh, it's very very interesting to see how that might end up playing out. Well, Mr. Pike, have yourself a wonderful Friday. Thank you once again to our friends at uh, Deuce Vodka. You've got the Deuce Neon. You've got the regular Deuce Vodka. It's your celebration vodka. Hopefully you're uh, able to have a few celebratory shots this weekend. If if you partake, if you don't partake, then cel- celebratory whatever. Uh, but if you do partake and if you're a vodka fan, uh, maybe a, a couple of celebratory drinks this weekend. Note the start time for Saturday's game between the Flames and the Habs. It's on the first half of Hockey Night in Canada, 5 o'clock Calgary time. Our pregame coverage on Sportsnet 960, the fan starts at 3, uh, and we'll take you all the way up to puck drop. Bye, Pike. Have a great Bye, weekend, Patty. my friend. I'll wave at you tomorrow. Uh, please do. Uh, I don't see anybody at the Saddle Dome, so it'd be nice. Uh, for Ryan Pike, the overlord at Flames Nation, my name is Pat Steinberg from Sportsnet 960, the fan. Plenty of coverage at flamesnation.ca. We'll talk to you next week on Flames Nation Live. Have a great weekend. Be safe. Stay kind to one another. Thank you very much for stopping.